More than 30 biotech and pharmaceutical companies around the world are racing to develop a safe COVID-19 vaccine. Investors, public health specialists, and other experts are watching closely to see which company gains regulatory approval first. But there's a big question lingering over the process. How do we balance safety with speed? Because of the urgency of the pandemic, the White House has launched Operation Warp Speed, which provides funding and other assistance to help companies speed up the development and distribution process. Under this program, the White House has chosen five different vaccine candidates to fast track. Four of the five candidates are being developed by seasoned companies, such as Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Merck, and Johnson & Johnson. The only newcomer on the list? Moderna. 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 Moderna, which is one of the most promising COVID vaccine creators, has already started phase three trials late last month. We're putting our bets behind Moderna. Shares of Moderna are swinging this morning. You sell Moderna, you buy Gilead. If Moderna can do it, you know that we're going higher. Moderna was founded 10 years ago and has yet to bring a product to market. But its new approach to a vaccine have many people hopeful for an alternative viable candidate during the pandemic. Here's where the high stakes race for a coronavirus vaccine stands. Biotech company Moderna, as well as Pfizer, which partnered with the German biotech company BioNTech, have been working on what's called an mRNA delivery approach to a vaccine. Many think it could be the best option for rapid production during the pandemic. Traditional immunization methods involve injecting a dead or weakened form of a virus into the body. This triggers the immune system to create proteins called antibodies, which protect a person in the event a live virus gets into their system. The mRNA vaccine approach doesn't require injecting a virus into the patient in order to create those antibodies. Messenger ribonucleic acid, or mRNA, are molecules that exist within the body that transport instructions to the part of the cell that creates proteins. The mRNA approach to the vaccine is to encode instructions into a synthetic strand of mRNA on how to create antibodies to fight the virus. Once those programmed strands of mRNA are introduced, the body's natural process of creating proteins takes over, and it reproduces the antibodies without needing Eating the weakened virus present in a person's system. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccines both use this brand new technology known as messenger RNA. And there are differences uh, in the two vaccines in the way they're formulated, in the way they're uh, put together, um, and actually in the way they're dosed. Pfizer's vaccine is given as two doses three weeks, weeks apart, whereas Moderna's is given as two doses four weeks apart. Uh, now, from the outside, these vaccines are going to look very, very similar, except uh, in that dosing regimen. But because there are these small differences in the way they're made uh, and designed, uh, they could work differently in different populations. This new approach to a vaccine has never been approved by any world regulatory body. There are some advantages to the mRNA approach. Because the vaccine doesn't contain a virus, the participant can't get infected by the vaccine, which is a risk for traditional immunization methods. The mRNA vaccine would also be easier to manufacture. Traditional vaccines that use a dead or weakened form of the virus must be grown inside live cells. The production of these vaccines is slower. For example, the most common way for the flu vaccine to be manufactured at scale is to grow the vaccine's viruses within fertilized hen eggs. Those eggs are incubated for several days to allow the viruses to replicate. The viruses are then killed, purified, and go through extensive quality testing before distribution. You're not doing any live virus. So issues relative to containing the virus don't exist. Uh, it is a streamlined process. It's new, so you're not dealing with legacy manufacturing issues, and it's quicker. So you can manufacture quicker, higher quality, and to a global scale, which is exactly what we need. The only questions are, these are new technologies. We're still learning how to do, do it exactly right. And I'm convinced that there won't be any vaccine on the market that has not done it exactly right. Because, you know, the only thing worse than no vaccine is a vaccine that is either uh, not efficacious or unsafe. That's not permissible. When the White House selected the five vaccine candidates in early June 2020 to receive prioritized access to clinical trials, it signaled that the government favored these drug makers' approaches to the vaccine over others. The U.S. government doubled down on this preferential treatment by pre-ordering 100 million doses from Pfizer in July 2020 and 100 million from Moderna in August 2020. But the vaccines are still being tested, with both Pfizer and Moderna's mRNA candidates entering late-stage clinical trials in the summer of 2020. 
Vaccines typically go through three stages of clinical trials before they receive regulatory approval. The first stage tests the vaccine on a small group of healthy volunteers to ensure the drug is safe to give to a larger group of people before moving forward. Phase two is larger, with several hundred people receiving the vaccine. This stage is to help figure out the best dosage for the vaccine, as well as to continue monitoring risks and side effects. But obviously everything is a risk-benefit proposition. So for some conditions, like for example, uh, ovarian cancer or, or lung cancer, the drugs can be uh, very lethal, but the disease is even more so. So you wouldn't accept the same degree of risk for uh, a cancer medication as you would for an allergy medication. Phase three studies are conducted on thousands of people. During the third stage of a study, researchers are monitoring for safety as well as how effective the vaccine is. Moderna's phase three study involves around 30,000 participants across 89 sites in the United States. Half of them will receive the vaccine while the other half receive a placebo. A placebo is a drug that is made with inactive ingredients so it will not have any real effect on the patient's health. The trial is a double-blind study, meaning neither the candidates nor the researchers know who received the placebo and who received the vaccine in order to prevent bias. Phase three trials typically last anywhere from one to three years, but the pandemic has led to the studies being fast-tracked. We anticipate our base plan for efficacy for the first interim readout to be in November. That's our base plan. Uh, our best plan is October. I think it's unlikely, but it's possible. And if the infection rate in the country was to slow down in the next weeks, it could potentially be pushed out as a worst case scenario, I would say, in December. Part of what's extraordinary about this process is everything has been shrunken. It is unheard of in, in vaccine history to go from the development of the vaccine into phase one, two, three trials within a span of what has it been like less than six months at this point. People always ask me, who's going to win the race? Who's going to be first? And here's my answer. I don't care. You know, I, I just want a, a safe and efficacious vaccine as quickly as possible that passes the appropriate regulatory and scientific muster. It doesn't necessarily matter uh, who gets to the finish line first on a vaccine because the supply of the vaccine will be so limited at the beginning that it's not a winner take all situation here. Basically, you need all hands on deck to be able to supply this vaccine to try to build up immunity so that we can stop the transmission of the virus. Because of the urgency of the pandemic, many experts expect some of the vaccines to be approved for wider use by the FDA through what is called an emergency use authorization or an EUA. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a lower standard. That, that EUA allows them to stage the uh, authorization, the access to the vaccine to different high-risk groups. An emergency use authorization is not the same as full approval. It sets a lower bar, essentially, in order to get drugs or vaccines to market faster. And now they would emphasize that the lower bar in terms of vaccines doesn't mean that they aren't sure that it works and they aren't sure that it is safe. It just requires less paperwork to get through the approval process. The FDA has granted an emergency authorization for certain coronavirus treatments treatments that have shown promising results in treating the virus in severe cases. One notable example is the emergency authorization for Gilead Sciences Remdesivir, a drug typically used to treat Ebola. For drugs, for example, the threshold for getting an EUA uh, is to prove that there may be benefit uh, of using the drug that outweighs any risks. Vaccines have a higher bar because they're given to healthy people. Uh, so where you're using a drug to treat somebody who is already sick, there might be more of a tolerance for risk there. With vaccines, the tolerance for risk is very low. They have to be extremely safe. You can't cause problems with vaccines uh, when you're trying to prevent problems in healthy people. The FDA announced in late August 2020 that it was considering fast-tracking a vaccine before phase three trials are completed. Soon after the announcement, nine CEOs of major biotech and pharmaceutical companies working on vaccines pledged to only submit for approval or an emergency use authorization after demonstrating safety and efficacy through a phase three study. Operation Warp Speed makes some people concerned that speed is the main goal here in developing vaccines. And speed is a goal in developing vaccines, but folks involved in the process emphasize that proving that these vaccines actually work and that they are safe is the foremost consideration here. Reuters has reported that Moderna has been, quote, squabbling with U.S. scientists during the regulatory process. Moderna is showing that it's got problems understanding how to work with the FDA. And I'm, I'm not uh, present at these meetings, but the press has been that Moderna is arguing with the FDA over a number of different issues, scientific issues. 
And it's good to have that, those types of robust debates. But at the end of the day, the FDA is going to call the shots based on what it feels is the best path forward. And Moderna, while it's free, of course, to do whatever it feels is the best thing for it to do as, as a company, will ultimately have to let the FDA make its decision. So, you know, early arguments are oftentimes a harbinger of problems to come a bit later. A company that is bringing its first product through the FDA approval process, this product happens to be a vaccine to try to help stop a pandemic. There are going to be a lot of questions there and we're watching a relatively young company, a relatively unproven company, figure this out in real time. You know, a lot, a lot of times there are bumps in this road but the world isn't watching them. Moderna is trying to go as fast as possible. The FDA is also trying to go as fast as possible, uh, but they need to work out exactly how to go as fast as possible while also ensuring the highest degree of safety and uh, getting the best data. Uh, and so while that report came out a few months ago, I haven't heard as many rumblings about potential disagreements uh, between Moderna and regulators recently. When asked for comment on the report, a Moderna spokesperson told CNBC, we are focused on our goal of producing a safe and effective vaccine expeditiously and rely on several important collaborations in reaching our objectives. On any given day, we have many different interactions between Moderna and representatives of the U.S. and other governments as we work together to successfully respond to the pandemic. Even though an mRNA vaccine will be easier to manufacture, there will still be an issue of creating enough doses for mass distribution during a global pandemic. What we anticipate is if you look at the, the few manufacturers that are both in the clinic already and that have scale for manufacturing. And if you do the math, it's only a couple of companies. We will all be supply constrained for quite some time, meaning we won't be able to make as many products as will be required to vaccinate everybody on the planet. In order to speed up the process and make sure vaccines are immediately available after approval, many companies are manufacturing doses before the clinical trials are completed. This process is called manufacturing at risk. You're manufacturing tens and hundreds of millions of doses with the hope that once their product gets approved, they'll be that much further ahead of the game and we can begin inoculating people sooner in the proposition. However, if their programs do fail, and some will, uh, all the doses that they manufactured will have to be destroyed. And that's an extremely expensive proposition. So one of the things that Operation Warp Speed does is it cushions that fall a little bit. It allows everybody to be smart and also more aggressive. And that's what we need to really defeat this virus in warp speed. Since there will be a limited amount of vaccine doses at first, the distribution process must be more selective. I like to make the analogy, an emergency room doctor doesn't go to everyone waiting and say, all right, I'm giving everyone five minutes equally. No, they look at who's having the most severe health problems, who's got the heart attack. They focus the attention there. And that should be the same approach with a vaccine. Where can the vaccine do the most in terms of saving lives initially? And then once you've saved a lot of lives and you've reduce the mortality rate, where can it do the most to reduce the economic, adverse economic impacts of COVID? Those are the two primary considerations in distributing a vaccine among countries. More than 170 countries are in talks to participate in the World Health Organization's global effort called the COVID-19 Vaccines Global Access, or COVAX facility. The goal of the program is to speed up vaccine development, ensure all countries have access to the vaccine, and distribute doses to the highest risk population within each country. The White House announced on September 1, 2020, that the U.S. does not plan to join the initiative, a move which has experts concerned. Vaccine nationalism, it's called. Keeping the vaccine for my country uh, is a natural response. Governments are responsible for the freedom and well-being of their citizens. But there's a limit to what they should do, and there's also some obligation to the world. The consistent message through all my experiences has been you know, an outbreak anywhere is an outbreak everywhere. I think it's narrow-minded for us to go back to looking at this as uh, as nationalistic uh, approach because you can't with infectious diseases. They do not care what border they're in. They don't need a passport. It is in our benefit to ensure that the rest of the world continues to get the vaccine, access to the successful vaccine, and that the rest of the world is protected because we live in this world. Until we can get this vaccine to every corner or vaccines to every corner of the world, we can't really go back to normalcy. 
It's also possible that an American company may not develop the vaccine first. If a country involved in the COVAX facility develops an effective vaccine, the U.S. could be excluded from the coordinated effort to distribute it equitably. So what will a post-vaccine world look like? The head scientist of Operation Warp Speed, Dr. Monsef Salawi, said in early September 2020 that he expects there will be enough doses to vaccinate 20 to 25 million Americans by the end of 2020. I think it's possible that we'll see a vaccine broadly available towards the end of the first quarter of 2021, but it's clearly going to slip into 2021. I do not think you're going to see a vaccine licensed by the FDA, get a biologics license application for broad uh, distribution in 2020. I think you're likely to see a staged authorization authorization where, where incremental groups are getting access to the vaccine through the end of this year, assuming that they work and that they're demonstrated to be safe and effective. That means that there's going to be a period of time between now and next summer where our reality stays about the same. You know, we don't know what's going to happen with the virus itself, but uh, it, it, I don't think that I see a lot changing. I hope that what we find is a better balance in which we uh, continue to take the mitigation measures so we don't have to take more extreme measures such as lockdown. As long as we find that in-between space where we can operate businesses, where we can, we can get keep the community transmission down enough to continue, you know, pursuing colleges, schools, you know, and huge part of this is going to be keeping the numbers down. There's concern among public health experts that distrust of vaccinations could hinder achieving herd immunity. Unfortunately, one of the groups that is most suspicious of the government are communities of color for lots of reasons, uh, but there is suspicion. And these are the same communities that have higher rates of infection. So it's the perfect storm of problems here. There'll be a question of whether or not we need to continue vaccinating the population. And does this coronavirus, this the SARS-CoV-2 become like the flu where we need to, or Pneumovax, where we need to continue vaccinating every year or every other year? Um, and, and what would that mean in terms of continuing to maintain that herd immunity? Um, so that's, that's those are some of the things to think about in terms of normal. The question of whether or not we go back to normal, well, it will depend on where you live in 2021.